Morning Year 12, we're here to talk about atonement, uh, the context, but I will be doing a variety of things during the talk. Obviously I'll explore AO3, the contextual elements, but then I will go on to absolutely make sure that it's properly integrated into your essays. So I'm going to do that by linking it closely to the text. And thirdly, I'm going to touch upon links to Gatsby, although I can't develop those too much in this time. Now, <clears throat> moving on, first of all, we began teaching, uh, talking about the Country House novel. And I think it's really important that we actually understand how important the Country House genre is. As we've said many times, it's an image of stability. It's an image of old England. In fact, you could link it back to Norman times and the idea of feudalism, that the lord of the manor controls the, the land around them. Evelyn Waugh, who was a very, very famous country house writer, he wrote a book called Brides Had Revisited, uh, squarely identifies egalitarianism as its foe. Egalitarianism means democracy and equality of opportunity. So the country house novel often stands against democracy and equality. It stands for an older hierarchical image. And Evelyn Waugh, for instance, was an arch-conservative who believed that England was in decline. So the argument is that the country house novel, in its original form, is actually against the idea of social change and democracy. But if we actually think about the Tallis family, and I'll, uh, I'll return to this later, they are actually an invented family. And um, they are a relatively new family, as we know. So in many ways, we could see them as a kind of pseudo-gentry. In fact, their money only goes back 40 years, as we learn later. I think that's very significant. Now, some of you will recall, when we studied the Country House novel, we looked at this uh, poem by Felicia Hemans uh, from 1827, where she said, The stately homes of England, how beautiful they stand amidst their tall ancestral trees, were all the pleasant land. And I mentioned to you before that the ancestral trees become a visual index of the idea of a lineage that stretches back. Uh, it's basically the iconography of the ruling class. So the country house, of course, is a symbol of power. It's a symbol of heritage, and it's a symbol of kind of cultural superiority. But as I said, we mustn't forget that Tallis House is a faux Gothic house. The Victorians themselves copied medieval architecture. And in the case of the Tallis family, they are precisely that, fake. Um, look at this description. Morning sunlight or any light could not conceal the ugliness of the Tallis home, barely 40 years old. <clears throat> then the narration moves forward and we feel Bryony in the narration where she quotes Pevsner. Now, Nicholas Pevsner was the greatest architectural critic of English architecture, and according to Pevsner, the house was a tragedy of wasted chances. Very interesting, isn't it? Because we feel Bryony's criticism of her own family focalized through this. This is, of course, post-war Bryony looking back at the Tallis house and disliking what it stands for. This is very interesting as well. The Tallis House is associated with privacy and with secrecy. If you wanted an absolute key quote, a man who spent a lifetime devising iron bolts and locks understood the value of privacy. And here they're talking about the Tallis grandfather who's associated with locks, with privacy, with secrecy. I'm going to put it to you that this is a kind of symbol of Victorian England a place where there was no transparency, a place where people would hide things, where there's no discussion. Now that's going to be absolutely key because in the 1930s, it's one of these watershed uh, times, isn't it? Where sexuality is emerging, where we have discussions by people like Sigmund Freud, where Robbie shows us that social class is fragmenting. So it's a key moment. England between the wars is something that you need to refer to in the exam, in your context, absolutely key. Now, of course, some of you will recall that 
throughout the novel, and this is something I've stressed on a number of times, it is a densely intertextual novel. Sometimes we wonder what AQA and their wisdom meant by A04, and I do hope they're listening to this, uh, intertextual references. In McEwen's novel, it will be no problem for us. It is densely littered with allusions to novels. It's a nerdy English teacher's dream, which is why I like it so much. We know that it has Malvolio and it has Clarissa in, it has Sons and Lovers, etc., etc. It's almost like McEwen is writing with a sense of English literary heritage on his shoulders. And I'm going to suggest that there are various reasons for this as I go through the lecture. Okay. Now, the epigraph to Atonement, those of you um, who were here will remember, comes from Jane Austen's novel, Northanger Abbey. Northanger Abbey, of course, is Jane Austen's attack on the Gothic. It is actually a parody of the Gothic novel, and the main character in it, Catherine Moorland, is somebody who's been reading far too many Gothic novels and believes that the footmen are villains and that General Tilby's house is actually some kind of Gothic castle where she is going to be kidnapped and raped or abducted or something. And of course, in the epigraph, this is Catherine Moorland being told off and being told that she's really silly. She's confided all of her fears to the male protagonist and he says, could they be perpetrated without being known in a country like this, where social and literary discourse is on such a footing, where every man is surrounded by a neighbourhood of voluntary spies, and where the roads and newspapers lead everything open? So the notion is, how absurd that we could have skullduggery going on in a country that has transparency and a press and basically is a modern civilised country. So it's an attempt to make sure that the Gothic novel is discredited in every... Okay, resuming now. At the end of the speech, Catherine Moorland runs away in tears of shame to her own room. So it is about the Gothic imagination being um, eradicated and shamed and humiliated. Think of the parallels to Bryony, how intimate those are how Catherine Moorland's fears are shown to be fictitious and irrational, and how she is humiliated. Now, of course, in Northanger Abbey, no terrible consequences follow Catherine Moorland's uh, misapprehensions of all these Gothic plots. But in our novel, it seems to be more within the paradigm of realism, because Bryony's fears are going to end in tragedy, and they are actually the substance of our novel. So there's a bit of a difference there when we think about it, isn't there? Okay, moving on. Um, Bryony, as we know, uh, is the, the, the book begins with the trials of Arabella, and this is absolutely key. We're plunged into the diegesis, into the story world of a young girl who lives in fiction. I think McEwen brilliantly catches the kind of lexical richness and density of the fairy tale. Some of the descriptions are actually artfully clumsy because they're meant to represent Bryony's melodramatic, heightened, hyperbolic language. And the focalization at this particular point, I think, is absolutely brilliant. If we look at the whole overarching philosophy behind the play, Bryony writes, the reckless passion of the heroine Arabella for a wicked count is punished by ill fortune when she contracts cholera during an impetuous dash towards a seaside town with her intended. Let's not forget the whole idea of Arabella is that she's punished for her lasciviousness, for her recklessness, for her passion. Now, if we put it in that paradigm, then we begin to understand why it is the two stories come together. Cecilia and Robbie's story and the trials of Arabella. Now, why is this the case? Well, in the 20th century, in the 21st century, there's been a great deal of attention to fairy tales, which in the past perhaps have been discredited and seen as a low genre. My old teacher at UEA, Angela Carter, who is also a very, very famous novelist, helped to rekindle this attention to story tales, and in particular to the way in which they gender people. Now, most of you who read storytells will see that girls are policed by storytells in many cases. And perhaps the most significant thing about storytells 
is the idea of very, very crude binary oppositions. Good prince, bad magician, villain, you know, heroine versus witch, etc. They are archetypes and they are not sophisticated stories that show uh, psychological complexity. So I'm thinking to myself, in The Trials of Arabella, Bryony is working within this genre of generalized archetypes, okay? And in particular, we will concentrate on this wonderful story from the Brothers Grimm, which is Little Red Riding Hood, which I think is going to be quite important to us understanding. Now, of course, in, as I said, in most fairy tales, the idea is that it is absolutely essential to stick to the path. What do I mean by that? Well, we all remember that in Little Red Riding Hood, her initial mistake is to leave the path when she was instructed not to. The overarching idea of the story tale is to provide us with a cautionary model that shows that adventurism is wrong. Now, there seems to me to be a bit of a connection between Emily, who is an arch-conservative and anti-feminist, who despises her daughter, uh, Cecilia, sees her as a blue stocking, doesn't she? As a sexless fool, as quite slovenly, as unmarriageable. And Bryony's concern with her sister's experimentation as well. So I think that parallel is quite interesting, isn't it? Straight away. Bryony, of course, feels the dullness of her middle class life. And this, of course, once again connects her to Catherine Moorland in Northanger Abbey. In Northanger Abbey, Catherine Woolard also resorts to a fictitious, exaggerated landscape because of the dullness of her English country life. So I think, uh, once again, the intertextuality is very interesting. And McEwen, it, although he's situating his novel in the 1930s and writing at the turn of the century, he's showing his traditions and his links to English fiction. Okay? Now, Bryony has a tremendous need for intrigue. She has this need for intrigue because she is a writer and a novelist. That's who she really is. And she's looking for a plot. In this rather pathetic scene where she has her tiny little squirrel skull, we are shown very vividly that she has this need to hide things, to have an area of privacy. But what she recognizes is nothing in her life was sufficiently interesting or shameful to merit hiding. So this need is absolutely key to her understanding of the fountain scene and to her understanding of the sex in the library. It provides her with the stimulus for her fiction, which is lacking in the life world. Key to the novel and a lay motif of English fiction is the idea of summer heat. Now it's a very interesting symbol because in English fiction, unrelenting heat is often associated with deviance. Um, Ian McEwan's brilliant first novel, which I really recommend you to read, is called The Cement Garden, and it involves a plot of incest between a brother and a sister in a little hideous little house in suburban England. But the overarching theme of it is summer heat and the idea that this unrelenting heat breaks down Englishness. It's almost like the English by nature are stoical and controlled and the heat releases inner demons which are usually hidden. And it's uh, again a motif in English fiction. I no doubt that McEwen is looking at this novel, Alpi Hartley, The Go-Between, which is again D.H. Lawrence-like. It's about sex between a, uh, a female aristocrat and again a working class man. In this case, uh, what's so interesting about it is it is constantly surrounded by this heat wave and the irrationality that this generates, okay? So I'm going to say I think the summer heat acts as a foreign threat which threatens traditional Englishness, its control and its stoicism. So don't underestimate how important that is. I'm going to move on to the fountain scene, which McEwen tells us in interviews was what he had written for nearly 20 years, and he left the novel. And I think for most of us, it's the climax of the novel, 
I think it's very important that you understand that the three focalizations of the fountain scene really get to the heart of the novel, and I think the heart of the novel is the notion of what is perception, how sub perception is so subjective, how the narratives with which we're familiar guide the way in which we see things. It's also an absolutely beautiful and cinematic scene. Now, first of all, Bryony's perception is very, very interesting when she looks at it. I'm going to have a quick look at this quote. There was something rather formal about the way he stood, feet apart, head held back. Now, Bryony, immediately when she sees the fountain scene, wants to place it within a familiar narrative of, uh, of fairy tales. And at first, she beautifully sees Robbie as a kind of woodcutter. Interesting because he's seen as noble and plain, etc., etc. There is actually a class conflict between the idea of the woodcutter and the princess. But for some reason, Bryony doesn't see this as significant. It becomes a terrible union when she begins to see Robbie as an enchanter instead, as having kind of mystical power over Cecilia. And I want to remind you that McEwen said, key to the novel is the perspective of Bryony, a girl who is on the cusp of adulthood, who feels the pubescent emerging sexuality, who has notions of the fact that there's a dark uh, sexual world out there. And there's that beautiful phrase, which I want you all to remember, the notion that she talks about an adult cabal, a kind of secret society. So I think what's key to understanding atonement is Bryony's age. And we must contextualize that as well, because she is a country house girl, a boarding school girl in the 1930s. Perhaps we could see that as the last age of innocence, okay? And she's very much thinking within this kind of childish genre. One of the things that we see is that girls of 13 are not privy to the adult world. So they see things which they shouldn't, and they do not have the necessary cognitive ability to process them. We need to think about this when we morally judge Bryony. We need to talk about the fact that whether she is actually has the equipment and the cognitive ability to make moral decisions. Many of us want to condemn her. I would suggest that's not McEwen's plan that he's looking for a less crude judgment, and he's looking for a judgment which is not so anachronistic. Many of us writing from the 21st century can sneer and laugh at people in the 1930s, but is that a mature decision? Is that what McEwen intended? I would say not. Now, one uh, Bryony decides that Robbie has this evil control over uh, Cecilia. This really seals his fate. So Robbie's fate goes all the way back to the fountain scene and to the fact that Bryony sees her sister taking off her clothes. What I'm going to suggest is she actually understands the sexuality of the scene. She understands that Cecilia is offering herself up as a kind of sexual object to Robbie. But she misunderstands that this is a consensual act. Rather than seeing it as a consensual act, she sees it as a form of grooming, doesn't she? She reads it within the paradigm today that we would see paedophilia or, uh, you know, terrible patriarchal control over a woman. Now, once again, I'm going to suggest that that goes back to fairy tales and to the notion that men by nature are seducers and women are prey. So she reads it within this paradigm because in traditional literature, there is no ability for people to actually have the idea of a consenting female. That notion and that subject never existed within him. Moving on then. Now, what's interesting about this is that when Bryony believes that Cecilia is being controlled by this evil arch villain, Robbie, she sets herself up as a rescuer. Once again, this is very interesting, because in some ways you could see it as a kind of model of female empowerment, but it actually does account for the fact of why when she goes into the library, instead of seeing sex, she sees rape, doesn't she? 
and she sees it as her role to intervene. Because femininity is so often seen as passive, because woman is so often associated with victim, she cannot imagine a kind of consensual relationship. Now, metafiction is absolutely key. I'm going to mention it a number of times in this lecture, okay? And this is a wonderful quote. Six decades later, she would describe how at the age of 13, she had written her way through a whole history of literature, beginning with folk stories derived from the European tradition of folk tales through drama with simple moral intent. Once again, what's McEwen doing? He's situating Bryony's consciousness and viewpoint within European literature. He is showing how we come to consciousness and we are what we are because of the stories that we are surrounded by. Look at this though. Much later, when Brian is a mature novelist, does she still have the moral edge? Does she see things in terms of uh, binary oppositions like fairy tales? No, her fiction was known for its amorality. She's become someone like Baudelaire or Flaubert, Zola, like the French realists who refuse to judge, who simply report. Bryony despises her earlier self, who saw things within binary oppositions. She now retreats, doesn't she? And she allows the reader to judge a great deal more. This is the metafictional element of the book, because the book is as much about Bryony's evolution as a writer as it is about the story of Robbie and Cecilia. Bryony's journey as a writer is absolutely key to our understanding. And even though we may not realize that in part one, guess what? That quote comes from part one. So if you look back, in a way, McEwen has written a novel which was designed to be reread, and he's put many clues in about the metafictional nature of this novel. Okay. McEwen, speaking of Brian, he says, she was a huge indulgence in literary models, is partly what leads her to make misjudgments. Okay. And I'm going to leave you to read that quote for yourselves because I need to hurry. So McEwen all the time is looking about what literary models do. He's looking at, in some ways, he's working within the tradition of seeing the imagination as extremely dangerous to people. Um, we have a tendency, don't we, in the Western world to believe empiricism, to believe what we see. But philosophers have known for a long time that what we see is what we want to see in many cases. Now, of course, when Cecilia narrates to us the fountain scene, and again, this is why I think we love the fountain scene so much. It just shows how people's perception really suits their needs and the narrative that they want. We have the idea that she tightened her hold and twisted her body. She says at the end of it, he did not exist. He was banished. Now we know, don't we, that later Cecilia realizes that she presents herself as a sexual object to Robbie. She has to do this because they're paralyzed in their relationship, aren't they? They have a kind of brother and sister relationship. In order for Robbie to see her as a woman, as a sexual being, she does this. But is this the conscious narrative? Of course it isn't. The conscious narrative is that she is resisting him. She is humiliating him. And finally, she has banished him. Interesting word choice. Is that Bryony writing as Cecilia? Or does that show us that Cecilia has elements of Bryony? Nice AO5 point to debate and interrogate. And of course, in Cecilia's uh, narrative, uh, Robbie is an absolute fool. He stood dumbly. We know that basically uh, Robbie is absolutely, you know, sex struck. And that's why he stands dumbly. But in Cecilia's narrative, he's just shown to be a fool who has put in his place. And part of her narrative is a class narrative, isn't it? That she shows her superiority to him. Now, I think one of the things, one of the many intertextual references, as we know, is Lady Chatterley's lover, and D.H. Lawrence is in the background quite often, especially in the sex scene in the library, okay? Um, we often wonder, don't we, why Robbie uses the term C-U-N-T, 
which is dangerous for me to put in this lecture, but I think goes to the heart of the book because it is that word which is going to condemn Robbie. Why does he choose such a harsh word? Because he, the, the end of it says, in my thoughts I make love to you all day long. Why did he simply not say that? Well, we have all sorts of reasons for it. But one of the reasons for it, I think, is that it's Lawrence's word. And Robbie has been reading, do you remember? Lady Chatterley's Lover, which he keeps under his desk, do you recall? He's also been looking at female anatomy. I don't need to go into too much detail here. So perhaps he's thinking in a very mechanical, almost medical way. Another thing, of course, <clears throat> is that he's trying to force his attraction to his consciousness. Because like Cecilia, Robbie has kept his attraction repressed. Possibly because of these kind of quasi-incestuous elements that it has. Wonderfully, McEwen is able to include Freud. Now you'll remember we've done this before and the whole idea of parapraxis. To Freud, Freudian slips, jokes, mistakes are never really mistakes. They are the revenge of the unconscious mind, aren't they? And of course, when Robbie seals the wrong letter, one of the ways that we could read it is definitely that this is an instance of Freudian parapraxis. That mistake is going to be absolutely key in our, in, our, in our novel, isn't it? That is going to lead to Bryony reading the letter. It's going to uh, lead to that letter being read by the police. And this horrific, horrible word will ultimately condemn Robbie. Of course, a, a more uh, positive way of reading that is that Robbie is forcing the sexuality to the fore. And indeed, when Cecilia does read the letter, possibly quite surprisingly, she doesn't seem upset by the particular language, does she? She calls it anatomical. Do you remember that? Which really is quite a euphemism for a word I think that even today often has a bit of shock. Now, going to the wonderful library scene, which in many ways is going to be the absolute climax of the novel, uh, pun not intended, he, uh, he had uh, been about to conjure for her a private moment of exuberance, a passing impatience with convention, a memory of reading the edition of Lady Chatterley's Lover. So this occurs just before the sex scene. Uh, McEwen wants us to think of Lawrence, and he wants us to think about this whole narrative of the power of sexuality to overcome social barriers. So if we get that kind of social barrier question, this is the key, isn't it? Robbie does see himself as a kind of Mellor's character. Yes, he has a first class degree from Cambridge, but he remains in his mind a char lady's son. And in spite of all his protestations of not considering class, we see a sense of humility and we see a sense of embarrassment. This is something that's very, very interesting, is that Cecilia, when she talks to Robbie just before they make love, she says, it's been there for weeks, her throat constricted. She drew a deep breath and continued, perhaps it's months, I don't know, but today, all day, it's been strange. I mean, I've been seen strangely, as if for the first time. And once again, this is very D.H. Lawrence-like. This mystical world of love and desire that we try to exile, that we try to have the conscious mind and logic and rationality and convention. We try to allow these things to control our actions and our being. But again, this Laurentian idea, at the end of the day, we're flesh and blood, sentient beings that are controlled by our bodies and our unconscious mind. Now, of course, the library scene itself is very like the fountain scene. It reminds us of perspectivism and how we tell ourselves stories. And it goes to the absolute heart of the novel. The message being rather than seen is believing, as McEwen says, believing is seen. OK, he pushed his body up against hers, pushed her dress right above her knee and had trapped her. Now, trapped being one of the key words, wouldn't it, okay? Then, when Bryony, because Bryony is the focalizer in this, sees Cecilia's arm up, see the arm up here? It was raised in protest or self-defense. He looks so huge and wild. Is there anything to condemn Bryony in here? 
I would suggest absolutely nothing at all. She reads the body language within the parameters that are available to her. Semiotics and reading visual information is based on cultural conventions. Briny sees rape, does she not? Because she has no model of consensual sex. I think it's very important that we understand that even the 1930s, the idea of women deliberately going in and enjoying sex, etc., would still be something which is incredibly taboo, wouldn't it? And that's why Bryony sees what she does. And now um, I'm going to move on to uh, move away from the sexual element and the passion and the romance to the idea more of social class, etc. And I wanted to point out that when Cecilia is talking and or, and thinking, Robbie had put down his trowel and stood to roll a cigarette, a hangover from his Communist Party time, another abandoned fad. One of the key things that Cecilia sees in Robbie is a fickle guy who can't make up his bloody mind, okay? He's actually quite lucky, isn't he, that her father has paid for everything, etc. And she's angry and irritated with him, and it fits into quite a class perspective. Later, we're going to see that that anger and irritation is part of frustrated sexuality. But at this particular time, there's an element of contempt in it, an element of the lady of the manor looking at the excessively privileged worker. And then she thinks of herself, there's an element of self-pity when she thinks of herself, punished for being in a different social circle at Cambridge, for not having a char lady for a mother. This reminds me of today where lots of middle class private school kids in England are really gutted that they're rich and stuff. They wouldn't mind having a bit of street, would they? The children of Semmer Villa, Sophia, who wish to be hip hop people, etc., or gang people, some of them who's, who rap at our school and who we laugh at. They are looking for that credibility, aren't they? That kind of being linked to the streets, to a real culture. Can you see that Cecilia feels that way? She feels that she's part of this dull middle class world. She wishes she had some of the libido of the working class, some of the street cred. Now, class and justice is very interesting. We've talked about this quite a lot. The villain, the absolute villain of the novel, of course, is Paul Marshall. It shows Ian McEwan, I think, is a good socialist, really, at the end of the day. He despises Paul Marshall. He hates his class. He hates his hypocrisy. He associates him with paedophiles. And I think I told you at the time, as McEwan's writing, <clears throat> many and many judges and powerful MPs were shown to be members of sex rings and paedophile circles, a kind of shady brotherhood. And what seemed to unite them, just as we see today with Me Too, is power. So McEwan is looking at the way that power is able to disguise sexual deviance and how they are able to project it onto perhaps less fortunate, less socially prestigious people. Now, that you'll remember this wonderful scene where he walked up and down and he takes cigarettes from his gold case. You know what it reminds us in the 1930s, the police were controlled by the aristocracy. We're told that Emily considers them servants, aren't we? So they set the narrative and they control the narrative, don't they? So one of the key things there is how class and justice, or should I say class and injustice, work together a lot of the time. Paul Marshall later will be shown with Lady Marshall Lola to leave in a Rolls Royce that gigantic, rather kind of ugly car. And it's something that allows them to hide continually. They're able to erect barriers. It connects to the idea of privacy in Tallis House, isn't it? And to the idea that they are able to use gagging orders and the libel laws to protect themselves. Another thing that I think McEwen wants us to think about is the way in which the rich are so rich and selfish but they're not able to give some money to charity, to some sub-Saharan charity, and feel pious and good about themselves and get titles. So again, I feel that McEwen is really interrogating the English class system and asking why it is that these people are able to get away with things as much as they do. Now, Lola is a very interesting character and obviously, I think, is meant to uh, remind us of Lolita, 
Nabokov's favorite, uh, famous novel, in which a young girl, again on the cusp of sexuality, is seen as the most desirable of sexual objects. I think because there's a very disturbing patriarchal element of enjoying the control and childlikeness of Lola. And that indeed is what Paul Marshall does. We all remember the horrific scene where he says, bite it, you have to bite it. And he makes a steeple of his hands. He is the classic voyeur who's enjoying her childlikeness. In this particular quote, he woke hot across his chest and throat, uncomfortably aroused when he went along the creaky corridor and entered the nursery. Notice Lola's in the nursery. Now he saw the girl was almost a young woman. That's the key word. Poised and imperious. Imperious is interesting because Lola is enjoying the sense of empowerment of her sexuality. It's almost like it's a challenge to our dark little paedophile, Paul Marshall. And he, this is where her doom is sealed. Of course, we know this is the scene where he rehearses the rape, where he grasps her and sees that he can get away with it at dinner, doesn't he? Okay, He's able to blame the children. So he's someone who realizes that using his status will allow him to censor others. It will allow him to impose his own narrative on people. Again, I remind you of what happens in the present, what we see with Me Too, what we see with Donald Trump, and untold powerful men who abuse their position. Part of this, of course, is the idea of England between the wars. Remember how I told you that that's so important. And I think you'll find that literature of the 1920s and 30s, literature of the conservative model is very interesting. It's almost like they recognize that history is changing. And literature of the 1930s is often filled with tremendous nostalgia. The house at Riverton is about the end of this kind of country house, innocent world. Isn't what McEwen's doing is actually blasting that apart and saying that this wonderful conservative world of harmony was actually littered with sexual abuse and hidden things and behind those locked doors what awful things were going along and that this was the class of people who had the power to impose a kind of historical narrative and isn't McEwen actually going beneath this narrative and questioning it? I would say he very much is. So again, I want to remind you of how social class is at the center of this particular narrative. And I think you will all realize that that is closely connected to Gatsby, isn't it? Again, where social class is at the center of the narrative and we're able to see a figure like Tom Buchanan, once again, is able to impose a kind of censored idea of reality through power. Now, one of the key things is that McEwen moves from the quiet conservativeness of the 1930s to an age that connects itself with ancient England, to the apocalypse that is about to happen. And of course, this occurs uh, partly with uh, Bryony's narrative in terms of the hospital. In part two, we see Robbie Turner's terrible events that occur in France and Dunkirk in particular, but we also see the female perspective. There is female history in this book. It's not like the recent movie Dunkirk that was recently made that is entirely male-centered. McEwen's more mature than that, and there's a female-centered element to the narrative. The unease was not confined to the hospital. It seemed to rise with the turbulent brown river swollen by the April rains, and in the evenings lay across the blacked-out city like a metal dusk. Something was coming to an end. This wonderful sense of apocalypse is part of Ian McEwan's message. And hopefully when I teach you next year, you will see that this is the key to understanding post-1945 literature. That this old world is going to collapse. There it is, literally. London in fragments. But also, some of these old institutions which have still lasted in the 1930s, are also going to collapse, okay? Two books uh, that we need to know about, okay? Uh, two poems, two poets, I should say. A number of times we have the Shropshire Lad. This refers to old, ancient countryside England, idyllic pictures of merry old England, etc. That's something that Robbie basically worships and loves. He is a country boy. 
he sees himself as a kind of inheritor of a Shropshire lad. But there's a rival kind of poet at the time, W.H. Auden, who's a very active homosexual, who's one of the first people who basically went for gay rights and was left wing and supported refugees and was a radical voice in his time. He was a Cambridge guy, and yet he gave up his kind of aristocratic privilege to champion the underclass and the poor. Now, it seems to me very significant that his is the poem that's quoted. In the nightmare of the dark, all the dogs of Europe bark, and the living nations wait, each sequestered in its hate. This is actually the poem upon the death of W.B. Yeats, the Irish poet who uh, W.H. Uh, w. Auden really looked up to. And it captures the zeitgeist, doesn't it? This terrible sense of sliding into war. And when we look in the novel, who are the people who are going to benefit from the war? We see Paul Marshall. So again, McEwen is questioning the kind of military industrial complex that benefits from war. It's almost Brechtian, it's almost Marxist in sort of suggesting that the upper class manufacturers look forward to war and see it as a kind of boom time. Now we know that in part two, what makes part two so brilliant in particular, I think, are the war scenes, okay? The majority were moving about the beach aimlessly. Now let's not forget one of the key things that McEwen is trying to do is blow out of the water the idea that Dunkirk was a triumph and he wants to see it as a mess. The whole of part two shows the British and the French as disastrously poor. He shows British command as laughable, as muddled, as stupid, as silly. Another thing that he wants to demythologize is the great worship of the RAF. We know the RAF man is nearly beaten to death in Dunkirk. So he's trying to blow out the water some of these ideas that Dunkirk was a wonderful time. And he wants to peel back some of Churchill's propaganda and show it as the incompetence of the upper class. McEwen being the son of a soldier, he is very determined to show that in many cases, the soldiers were the lions led by donkeys. And um, these kind of apocalyptic scenes, they basically contrast with uh, I think the notion that Dunkirk was some kind of liberation. It's a beautiful picture of it, of course. A recent movie is very interesting because I think that movie also reinstates the idea that Dunkirk was a valid, you know, all about valor and it was a great moment for English, etc. I think one of the key things that I want you to see in terms of form is that McEwen uses kind of surrealism. And he brings out the fact that these scenes are so bizarre, like, for instance, Robbie catching the pig. And that's one of the things that war does. It is so irrational that it is reminiscent of surrealism. Perhaps you can't even describe it within the paradigm of realism any longer. You have to reach for surreal techniques to show just how discordant some of these images are, how hard they are to actually understand. Um, I wanted to remind you, of course, that there are parallels, are there not, between the Valley of the Ashes, where you have this fantastic farm, where you have T.J. Eccleton and his huge eyes, and where you have the absolute chaos of Dunkirk. Even in peacetime, Fitzgerald also finds surreal, bizarre, apocalyptic, hell-like imagery. In his case, he seems to be focusing on criticizing the capitalist industrial world. And I think he's quite visionary in terms of seeing what it's going to produce in terms of waste. Of course, McEwen has a different um, uh, uh, agenda. He wants to show basically how terrible war is. And in this wonderful scene where Robbie has to catch the pig, I think it's one of the greatest scenes in the novel because it is so surreal. And what makes it so surreal, of course, is Robbie's delirium. The scene is focused through Robbie's increasing delirium as he moves closer and closer towards death. Little clusters had formed around the wounded left by the last Stuka attack. As aimless as the men, half a dozen artillery horses galloped in a pack along the water's edge. A few troops were attempting 
to uh, write the upturned, uh, upturned whaler. We'll contrast that with the Dunkirk film that was made recently. Aimless, not led, a lack of leadership, chaos. McEwen is angry with the British military leaders. He wants them exposed for their incompetence. Again, the Valley of the Ashes is bonded on the one side by a small river. We said that that is reminiscent of the River Styx, okay? And um, that really does contrast, doesn't it, with Robbie who is able to draw upon his memories, isn't he? So amongst the chaos, one of the most powerful things that we see is that Robbie is able to overcome pain, fever, etc. So if we're looking for love as empowering, then I think we have to look at these, his most sensual memories. The few minutes in the library, the kiss in Whitehall, were bleach colourless through overuse. So even though they bleach colourless, they are there available to him. The power of memory is absolutely key. And perhaps one of the most powerful intertextual references is the idea of Tris, uh, Tristan and Isolt, this wonderful love story. We could, of course, say that you could think about something like the Odyssey, but so often within the romance genre, you have a journey back by the hero who has to overcome the trials and tribulations. Most recently, uh, the novel by Charles Franzen called, not Charles Franzen, uh, Cold Mountain. Cold Mountain is a very recent story of a soldier tracking back, fighting people, overcoming impossible odds to get back to his woman. So it's a real motif of romance, isn't it? Yeah. And we mustn't forget Sophia's favorite quote. Oh, when I was in love with you, then I was clean and brave. All the time Robbie is quoting poetry, looking at her letters, but he is filled with apprehension that Turner the shell, the, sh the shrunken man, is no longer worthy. So one of the great barriers between them is not only the distance and the war, but Robbie's lack of self-worth, that he no longer feels to be the man that he was, the young man who could have come out of the pages of a Shropshire lad. Now, women in the Second World War, and I have to go quickly because I'm acutely aware of the time. Already I told you it's interesting that we have a very female-centered um, element to this. And I think uh, we could see this as a kind of her story. Next year you'll do The Handmaid's Tale, which is all about decentering male narratives of history. So it's arguable, and I think it's almost indisputable, that woman's story in the war has often been neglected, okay? And Bryony gives us this. It's key to the whole idea of atonement. We have to see Bryony's suffering if we are to forgive her as readers. The uniform, like all uniforms, eroded identity, and the daily attention required, ironing pleats, pinning hats, straightening seams, shoe polishing. We have this asyndetic listing, don't we? which is characteristic of poetry, together with the hyphen, began a process by which other concerns were slowly excluded. Bryony herself is facing a kind of soldier's experience. She is having her individuality smashed. Before this, she's been the moddy, coddled little darling, the young girl who is loved by everyone, by Leon and Emily, etc. Here she has been institutionalized and smashed down. And it's important in terms of her journey of atonement. We also begin to see how that experience is closely tied to her journal. Again, another metafictional element to the narrative, isn't it? I said to you that there are two massive mar uh, narratives, aren't there? One of the narratives is Robbie and Cecilia. The other is the evolution as Bryony as a writer. This is maturing Bryony as a writer. Before she had nothing to write about. Now she has human experience. Is McEwen telling us that having pain and suffering and human experience will refine you as a writer? Does it give her the realistic language, that precision of expression that makes her a better writer? I would suggest that it, it does. And we see, of course, don't we, that McEwen makes the story very realistic by including figures like Cyril Connolly and the Horizon magazine, which championed emerging writing. 
So once again, it situates Bryony's life within literary heritage. We could argue that Bryony's life follows the changing nature of English fiction. And of course, at this stage, her writing was rejected, and it was rejected because it was too fragmented, do you remember? And Cyril Conley asked her to move the plot forward. Very important metafictional reference, because that's precisely what she's going to do when she cheats us in the rest of part three and gives us this beautiful lover scene, this reconciliation, this reunion, which later we will be, we'll have smashed, won't we, when she admits that that was her imaginative creation. In a sense, that was her gift to Robbie and Cecilia. Um, and let's not forget that at this point, she sees herself as a kind of Virginia Woolf stream of consciousness writer. I think she does that because the fragmentation suits her. She doesn't want plot at this stage, does she? She actually just wants intense psychological experience because she doesn't have the plot. She doesn't have an ending. Now, you'll recall on her day out, two things she does. Firstly, she gives us the marriage of Paul Marshall and Lola. And that is true, isn't it? Wonderfully described as a quote that we must all remember, the mausoleum of their marriage walled up. Again, this idea of privacy, this idea of shutting out rival narratives, an example of hegemony. Uh, media students here will know what I mean by hegemony, when you have the power to impose meanings through institutions, etc. The other thing, of course, we're given is the story, the scene when she visits Robbie and Cecilia. Alas, this is fictional, though. So just to remind you, metafiction is a form of literature which emphasizes its own constructedness. It draws attention to the fact that it is fiction. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that in part three, when we first encounter this scene in the kind of lodgings, it is an incredibly real scene, and we don't realize that it's metafiction. It's interesting for you to analyze what is your emotional response to this metafiction? Were you disappointed later? Did you find it even more beautiful in some ways? Were you angry? Did you feel cheated? Do you feel like there's a contract between the writer and the reader? We'll believe you, you should tell the truth. Well, that's the traditional paradigm of writing, isn't it? What does metafiction do? It questions and destabilizes that. It says, believe nothing from me, this is only a story. We can't immerse ourselves in it. Many people hate this kind of fiction. Many teachers here don't like teaching atonement for this particular reason, because it questions and destabilizes that. So we know that it's an imaginary scene, but it's a beautifully done one. She pulled him closer, drawing him into her gaze. She kissed him lightly, lingeringly on the lips. Bryony writes beautifully, and she creates the scene, as I said, as a gift. We have to ask ourselves as readers, are we happy with this scene though? Do we see what Bryony is doing? Some of us do and some of us don't in the class. It's very interesting, isn't it? Now, last class, we have to finish there for today. I'm going to pick it up next time, okay? So we're going to end with this beautiful kind of image that Bryony gives of Cecilia and of Robbie together again. And then we're going to talk next time about the metaphysical elements to it. And we need to go on to part four, because seeing the evolution of Bryony as a writer and what happens to her as a human being is absolutely key.